With capital ships like the Javelin, the Idris and the Kraken still some way away in Star Citizen, it's easy to think that we won't be seeing any large-scale fleet engagements for quite some time. But we believe that getting a head start is one of the key advantages to playing the game in its alpha state. And I think there are a lot of aspects of the game right now that can help us plan for fleet engagements in the future. So today we're going to be kicking off a brand new series, Fleet Logic, in which we talk about these large-scale capital fleet combat operations in SC. So if this sounds good to you, then grab a cup of tea while I roll the intro, and then let's get into it. Hello and welcome back or welcome to the channel. I'm Loudguns and today marks the start of our brand new series Fleet Logic. The plan is to combine elements of theory crafting with practical experimentation in game. So we're not expecting perfection straight away and this series is mostly going to be focused on cataloguing various things we're trying and testing within the organ community as we look to establish good fleet doctrine for our own combat elements. So if you'd like to get involved at all, please do come and say hi over on Discord. You'll find the link in the video description down below. I know that I'm not well known for combat themed content, despite my name, and I would very definitely leave the high level combat tuition to aces like Jonathan Winters or Avenger 1. But a long time ago in a county far far away, I did graduate with a degree in military history, and it's the big macro questions about full scale fleet combat in Starset that really interest me. So rather than jumping straight into it, today we're doing a session zero. And this is an idea from D&D and other tabletop games, where rather than sitting down and getting straight into a campaign, you have one session first that helps to establish the principles and puts everyone on the same page. So before we get into a lot of testing and reporting back on what we find out in future episodes, we want to establish what we're setting out to achieve and some fundamental points that are going to drive our thinking as this series evolves. And first up, I think we've got to talk about the purpose of fielding capital fleets. It might seem really simple, you know, Hulk smash, but realistically, extremely big military vessels and all of their attendant support craft are going to be incredibly expensive to run, both in terms of resources and people. It could be that you want to launch a large fleet with no other objective than to go and whale on a rival org, and just see who comes out on top. Unless you've got an underlying reason for doing it, you're probably going to run out of cash to support your efforts. Primarily, fleets are going to be a way for orgs to project power over large areas of space, controlling a zone so that more industrially minded players can make profits and pay them. This informs the scenarios that we may want to start preparing and training for. Things like engaging enemy fleets, disrupting enemy supply lines and protecting our own, attacking and defending fixed locations in space such as stations, controlling the orbit of a moon or a planet to deploy and secure ground forces, enforcing or breaking blockades, resupplying fleets in action, and conducting anti-piracy operations or patrolling space that's already been secured. And in future episodes, we'll look at focusing more specifically on a certain aspect like this, and while we'll theorycraft how things might play out in a more developed version of the game, we'll also be looking at putting things into practice with actual in-game scenarios. And another big hurdle to having a good discussion around fleet composition in Star Citizen is the mishmash of current ship classifications. Not only are these a bit weird in SC terminology, there's not one good way of classifying ships in the real world, since the classifications of naval ships is far from uniform. Even two English-speaking countries like the UK and the USA can't agree on a common language when it comes to how they classify their warships. And in Starset, this is further complicated by what my orgmate Sila has termed scale squishing. The largest concept ship a player can own right now is the Javelin. It's a total beast, it takes 80 plus crew, has a myriad of weapon systems, and yet it's only classified as a destroyer, which a lot of fleets in the real world regard as one of the smaller capital ships. This is because in the wider verse, there are going to be bigger ships that we can't take control of. You've got the UEE Dreadnought Retribution, the Bengal Carrier and the Vandal Kingships, all of which dwarf the Javelin. 
However, in player-controlled fleets, if we were to look for a battleship, then the Javelin would be our logical choice, since we can't reliably access the others. We then have to think about the further scale squishing of the now in Star Citizen, as opposed to the future. Right now, we don't have any of these big combat capital ships in-game, so if we're going to look at actually trying to put some of our theory crafting into practice, we have to arrive at a scaled-down analogue for the here and now in-game. The easiest thing for us to do is to think about ships in terms of the roles they are most likely to perform within a fleet, and assign that group a name. It might not be perfect, it might conflict with your particular country's navy, it might not line up with the RSI matrix of lies. And it might well change over time as we discover new things. But just establishing a common language is important, since I want this series to be open to discussion and debate. So first up we have carriers. Not necessarily the heaviest hitters themselves, but capable of delivering smaller craft to a battlesphere. In endgame terms, the primary ship in player hands that fits this bill will likely be the Kraken. Although if you're part of an especially large and or dedicated org, you might be able to get your hands on a super carrier in the form of the Bengal. Further down the bill, in a pinch, we might find something like the Liberator. Although personally, I see the Lib as more of a ship transport for getting things from A to B across the verse as opposed to a fleet carrier. In game right now though, the best analogue we've got is the 890 Jump. It's probably got a lot more gold and marble than a Kraken's gonna have, but its hangar can comfortably accommodate a number of light fighters like the Arrows, or a host of snubcraft. Battleships are your heavy hitting ships of the line, primarily focused on delivering heavy amounts of firepower at relatively close ranges. This space in the endgame belongs to the Javelin with its focus on brawling up close, but in the current version of the game hammerheads are likely the next best thing in player hands. Cruiser is a fairly loose term that generally speaking covers ships like the Idris that sit a bit below the combat capabilities of the Javelins. The name Cruiser stems from the Age of Sail, it's referred to the type of mission that ships engaged in, from commerce protection to raiding. These ships functioned as cruising warships, able to break off and function independently or group up with the main fleet to add their firepower. In terms of versatility and firepower, the Redeemer is probably our best analogue in the current game. Destroyers are fast-moving escort ships designed to protect the more important ships of a fleet or a convoy. In the late 1800s, navies were developing torpedo boats aimed at moving in quickly to attack larger warships, whose main weaponry and manoeuvrability left them vulnerable to such attacks. Destroyers, or torpedo boat destroyers to give them their full name, were designed to counter this threat. Armed with their own complement of torps and engineered to be much swifter, they would fend off the attacks by such ships. To me, this is the role that the RSI Polaris may come to play in large-scale org fleets, either shielding the main force from attack by ships of a similar size and a bit down, or launching harassing strikes on the enemy's larger capitals. For now, the RSI Connie Andromeda should be able to stand in until its bigger brother arrives. It's got a fair whack of weaponry in the form of four pilot-controlled guns, and dual turrets as well as a huge complement of missiles. Corvettes are traditionally the smallest class of rated warships, and corvettes tend to be somewhat specialised, and in modern navies they include things like missile boats and fast attack craft. In star sit terms, this is the logical place to slot things like the hammerhead with its anti-fighter capabilities. Due to scale squishing, meaning that we've had to steal the hammerhead as a stand-in battleship, we can't use it again here, and there's no really good analogue in the current game for some of the specialised ships we might see in the future. For now, the role that corvettes do screening the main battle fleet, or carrying out specialised attack runs, will probably just be taken up by fighters. And subs are a tricky one to equate in space warfare, since the primary advantage of a submarine in traditional naval warfare is their ability to add a third dimension to the battlesphere. Surface vessels can only traverse on a 2D plane, so subs have a huge advantage here. However, where we can see some similarities is in terms of stealth, and for this reason I see the Retaliator Bomber filling this niche within fleets. Stealth is currently non-functional in SC, but we know that over time this will be developed, and stealthy bombers like the Tally are likely to fill the role of striking without warning with a high-powered torpedo payload. And finally, we have our small one- and two-person craft, which are fairly self-explanatory and translate well into game now. 
Fighters come in three weight classes, heavy, medium and light. Heavies like the Vanguard, Scorpius or Hurricane tend to be preferable for MVN engagements, while light fighters like the Arrow, Gladius or Talon are better at winning out in 1v1s or 1v2s. Medium fighters like the Hornet and the Sabre straddle the lane, offering less of a trade-off but at the cost of not excelling in either role. And meanwhile we've got bombers like the Aegis Eclipse which rely upon a port torpedo payload to attack larger targets while only having very limited defensive capabilities. And that brings us on nicely to our third chapter, Threat Assessment. In this we're aiming to understand what ships are meant to be strong and weak versus other classes. Right now in game this is complicated by the fact that we haven't got ship armour implemented, and you get this weird situation where a lion can die to a thousand mosquito bites. Realistically, when it's in game, we would expect the small weapons like the size 3s found on a lot of light fighters, simply won't output enough damage to penetrate the armour of larger ships. The power of light fighters in the game currently is further overstated by their manoeuvrability, and at some point in the future this is likely to be curtailed to some degree by master modes, meaning that a single arrow can no longer just spin around an Idris slowly chopping away at it. So while it is perfectly possible to cheese things right now, we want to focus our training and fleet building around where we see the game going in the future particularly when CIG have flagged these changes that are to come. A good example of this comes from our industrial side, where for a couple of years now we've been orienting ourselves more towards working on multi-crew via the mall, even when it made more sense from an AUEC perspective to fly solo in prospectors. And now that CIG have made the changes that we predicted to increase the power of a single mole relative to multiple prospectors, this approach is paying dividends with our crews already well drilled. So we want to try and replicate this in our combat drills and start preparing for foreseeable changes ahead of time. I'm not knocking any fight races out there, fighters are undoubtedly going to perform a crucial role in a fleet, but time spent practicing circle strafing a capital ship to death is probably wasted time in the long run. Instead, we feel that the role of fighters is primarily to screen the fleet against inbound bombers that pose an actual threat to your capital ships while also protecting your own bombers against enemy fighters as they make their attack runs. During a large-scale fleet engagement, there's likely to be another war being fought on a much smaller scale, with all the single and dual seaters battling it out to perform and deny bombing runs. If we get into the realm of shipboarding or planetary landing during an engagement, fighters could also be responsible for performing attack runs on enemy dropships to prevent the flow of marine units to target ships or the ground. At the other end of the scale then, carriers have limited capabilities within an actual battle sphere. Their primary ordnance is the fighters and bombers that they carry, and while they might be large enough to mount some heavier weaponry to protect themselves against other caps, they go give up a lot of potential to leave room for the flight decks. Meanwhile, battleships are all about raw power, and would almost certainly represent a meaningful threat to any other capitals and corvettes. However, while they may have some point defence, they'll be relying on fighters to scream them against smaller bombers in the same way that tanks need infantry support to be truly effective. Cruisers will probably strike more of a middle ground, with ships like the Idris capable of mounting high-powered weaponry, but not to the extent of ships like the Javelin. Still alone, they should represent a clear threat to destroyers and corvettes, while if they have a numbers advantage, they could take on battleships. With their higher manoeuvrability and focused weaponry though, I can see cruisers being particularly effective at hunting enemy carriers. Destroyers are more likely to fill that role of screening the larger ships of a fleet against the attentions of anti-capital corvettes or heavy bombers. And corvettes, owing to their specialised nature, are likely to be particularly strong against one type of threat while sacrificing a lot of potential against anything else. The Hammerhead, for example, may focus on providing flat cover against fighters, while the Perseus may specialise in taking on enemy corvettes and caps. And finally, for our Session Zero chapters, I think we have a really important fourth factor that we need to remind ourselves of regularly, and that's to not forget that Star Citizen is a game. I think there are a lot of content creators out there who make really interesting videos bringing real-world comparisons into their discussions, and I do feel there's merit in looking at how things work in the real world, and considering why real militaries do things the way that they do them. 
However, I also think it's really easy to get carried away with it and lose sight of the fact that behind the universe of Starset, there's a team of game designers whose overall goal is to deliver an experience that is both challenging and fun. Not everything in SE is going to make sense from a realism perspective. The flight model is not a replication of true space flight, and Chris has talked a number of times about how he wants to take a Star Wars-esque approach of World War II in space. The reason behind this is simple. You know, for realistic space combat, we should look at TV series like The Expanse. In that show, they might still have managed to make it look visually stunning from a third-person perspective, but the reality for a combatant in a game modelled on realistic mechanics would be staring at MFDs and using complex maths to plot firing solutions to target ships that are outside of visual range. Realism, quite simply, wouldn't be fun for the majority of players. So I'm leaving this note here as a reminder to all of us to not get carried away with those real-world comparisons and using them to make in-game conclusions. So I know this was a little bit different, but that's one of the things I love about this game and about our Org Frontier Consolidated. Both of them attract players with a wide variety of interests. And while I'm often typecast as an industrial player, I think it's important to remember that industrial gameplay at the highest levels is only going to be possible if it's combined with combat gameplay at the highest levels. So I hope you found this interesting and that you're keen to see more in this series. We're going to be following up with these more specific episodes after this one where we take apart a scenario and combine it with the in-game testing. So if you've got any ideas, feel free to drop them down in the comments. And if you'd like to stay tuned, be sure to hit the subscribe button. But with all that said, I'd just like to say a big thank you for watching all the way to the end and I look forward to seeing you next time.